Lavelda, thank you so much for joining me. Oh, it's wonderful to be here. Always a pleasure to have a chat, Maria. Always a pleasure. I know, I know. We do like to have a bit of a chinwag. So, so listen, we're going to be talking about all things emceeing, but actually you started your life not as an MC when you were on stage. You started as a speaker and you were quite young, weren't you? Though, although you are still very young, especially compared to me. Tell us the story about when you first got on stage and, and what you were doing. To be honest, I was one of those kids who always loved a stage, whether it was drama, whether it was a debate. Um, so the first real memory I can have of standing on a stage, it was an audience of about 300 at high school. So I must have been about 13 at the time. And that I remembered partly because I had photographic evidence of it. <laughs> I don't remember exactly what I was talking about, but the half the school was there. Um, so yeah, kind of stumbled into it. I don't know why. I think I'm just a bit of a big mouth in that regard. I probably shouldn't say that. <laughs> you're confident on stage. I wouldn't say you're a big mouth. You're confident and you're a natural. And you moved into emceeing. And why was that? Did you choose that as opposed to speaking? So initially I was speaking to grow a business and if I'm honest, I didn't have any idea what the hell that business was. So I was kind of flitting about because speaking was a thing and I found it very comfortable. And then um, I think the first couple of emceeing gigs happened very accidentally. So I'd be at a conference and I'd be asked to introduce the speakers and the organizer would love it and tell me it was fabulous. And I just thought, oh, this is the, <laughs> this is the, um, the black sheep of speaking, to be honest. It's, it's the gig you take when they won't give you the main stage. Um, that was until I started to realize how important that role is and that even though it comes quite naturally to me, it's not that easy to do. <laughs> um, there's so many different moving parts and the speaking piece was almost easier. And I actually enjoyed it a lot more. It was easier, it's easier for me to turn up and engage with an audience because I love hosting. I've always loved like having people around and how do we make it lots of fun and you know make it so that people are really enjoying themselves. And I thought, well, this is wonderful. I don't have to fill the room. <laughs> I don't have to be responsible for any of that stuff. I just get to make sure people have fun. You know, so um, kind of accidentally, but then the more I did it, the more I enjoyed it. And then I just thought, well, if I'm enjoying it so much, what if I just told people this is what I did and, and really gave it a go rather than stumbling into the odd speaking and engagement after the other? Yeah, no, brilliant. And so there's lots of terms for this. I mean, I use the word MC, but you mm -hmm. can call host, facilitator, compare, moderator. Which ones do you use or do you use all of the above? I tend to use all of the above. I would say that there's a distinction predominantly between a compare MC and a moderator. Um, to me, a moderator is somebody who tends to be very good at interviewing. And so um, typically they'll have had a background in something like journalism or or they'd have had a hosted a show or something where they ask you're expected to sit and moderate a conversation. So I would say that's quite particular. Um, an MC or a compare is kind of interjecting in between. And some MCs are great at moderated discussions, but not all of them are. <laughs> so I would probably say that one stands out slightly differently, but I used all of them. Okay, so you said earlier that you do it because it's fun, uh, and actually there's a lot more to it than having fun, really. What do you see your role, apart from making sure that the audience is engaged and have fun, what else is important in your role as the, as the MC and host? So I see that I have three clients, one that, one that pays, but the, if I don't please the others, then the whole thing's a little bit of a disaster, to be honest. So um, I, I have three primary roles. One is to um, help to make the, the event a fun event to be at for the audience, an engaging experience to manage the energy of the room, to notice when people are a little bit sleepy and perhaps suggest to do something different, but, but to be reticent of who the people are in the audience such that they, they feel like they've been looked after. Um, the second is to make the speaker feel like um, they're coming on to an incredible crowd of people and, and that they're the best person in the world. And so it's really important to me that an introduction is done powerfully and that names are correct and all of that sort of thing. And the third is the event organizer. And, and in that regard, my job is to make their job easier. Um, so I kind, of, I kind of see myself as if I'm doing my job right, you have one less thing that you need to concern yourself with because you know there's so many things going on on a day, the last thing you need to be doing is worrying about what's happening at the front of house. And if something changes, my job is to help to keep things to time and manage that schedule so that the organizer's vision comes to life. 
Fantastic. So you, you mentioned keeping to time. Now, some speakers, you, you can't get them off the stage, especially if it's and a terrible thing to say, but usually it's not the ones that have been brought in and paid to speak, but the ones who aren't being paid to speak that are the hardest to get off because once they're on, they're staying. How do you handle it? How do you keep people to time? So I think keeping to time starts long before somebody gets to the room actually and um, I think if you leave it until the day is normally when you have the hardest problems of keeping people to stage so I will always start with the organizer by asking some really pointed questions up front about how they intend to manage that and what information is given to the speaker um, it's also important before people go on stage I will normally grab them really quickly and say this is what's happening you've got a clock at the front it's going to start and count down it'll change color at five minutes. If it's at zero and flashing, you're in trouble. If the light comes on in front of you, you're in serious trouble. And if I have to step up on the stage, we've got a problem. <laughs> so, you know, so just that little bit of people understanding the importance of things. I think where, where stuff really gets messed up is look, if we're running behind, I need to coordinate with the speaker and the organizers to say, how do you want this handled? Are you okay with us just swallowing up the fact that we're now five minutes over and so we finish five minutes later and that would be acceptable to all concerned or are we going to need to start cutting a break or telling a speaker that they're going to have two minutes less um, but if you don't tell people something's changed before they go on the stage that's normally when you have problems um, it's normally when a speaker is expecting to be speaking for half an hour and you've unilaterally changed it to 20 minutes you've given them no upside and then they've looked down expecting to see one time and they see something completely different um, the professional speaker the real true professional speaker will work around it and but for other speakers especially in a conference environment where this isn't what they do all the time you actually fluster the speaker and you create a bigger problem so <laughs> i think for conference organizers in particular where maybe it's not you may be hiring somebody from an organization to speak on behalf of the organization. That sort of timing moves, I mean, they have a serious impact on speakers. So it's as much my responsibility to help on the day, but also working with organizers long before you even get to the day to make sure that people understand what's going to happen and who to talk to if times change. Yeah, really good advice to be prepared way in advance and to, and to plan it. So talking about preparation, do you write your own scripts? Does the client write the script? Does it vary? I have a combination. Very much depends on the organiser, depends on um, the complexity of the production team that they have. So um, for larger organisers who have a full production team and a full event team, they will send me through scripts of things that they want. For other organisers where perhaps they don't have a full production team, I get a set of bios <laughs> thrown at me. Um, and then I will do my best to reach out to the speakers. I also work very closely with the organiser because as much as I can go away and research an introduction, there's a reason why you picked this particular speaker. And so it helps to have that insight so that I can help to pull the event together because I might pick something completely different as to why you pick that speaker and it's completely valid, but without the context so that I'm piecing it, to, it might be a reason why you put one person after the other, for example. So I do walk through it with organizers to understand what their editorial feel was so I can understand what that thread was. And then I'll work with the speaker as well. To be honest, it completely varies. I think, um, look, if there's stuff you really want I, I, from a speaker perspective, if there's, if you want to be introduced powerfully, as it's, it's as much your responsibility as it is the responsibility of the MC. You cannot complain if you did not bother to reach out to me in advance. Us, I'm speaking for all MCs, <laughs> you know, you cannot get frustrated if you didn't reach out in advance. You can't get overly upset if you know that your name is the sort of name that's often pronounced differently or, um, you come from a country where your name doesn't sound the way it looks uh, because of accents and that sort of stuff and you didn't make any effort to correct that at all and you know people get it wrong all the time you know when your name is mispronounced mine is always been sensi <laughs> not when you're talking to me darling. not when i'm talking to you um <laughs> but more often than not i get lovey da vincenzi <laughs> 
<laughs> Unless I tell people otherwise. Yeah, no, you're absolutely right. How to pronounce your name for sure. I actually think it's part of the speech to provide the introduction. Although I do like your point that the organiser has chosen that speaker for a reason. So the context would come from the client but the actual introduction you know this is my expertise this is yeah. what I'm going to talk about should come from the speaker what about the outro after the speaker has spoken it depends on what they've said and how much time is left for it so not all some organizers the um, the event is so condensed there's no time for any of that right so normally when I do an outro where I have a little bit more time I am listening diligently to the whole talk. I will pick out a few key points. <laughs> you know, wasn't that wonderful or wasn't that really interesting? I love what they said about that. It was an intriguing insight that they've brought in about X, Y, and Z. Definitely check out that PDF that they had or, you know, check out the website, whatever it was that they mentioned. Um, so I typically tend to do that at the end as well. But it depends on how much time I've got. Sometimes, there is no time. Sometimes it's like right on to the next because um, often organizers do not put time in for introductions. And so therefore, in order to keep it to time, I can't speak for three minutes about a person to get the audience warmed up because you didn't allow three minutes <laughs> for me to warm up the audience. That wasn't taken into account. So if I did that at the beginning and did it at the end, we're gonna have a problem. So now I have to do 30 seconds, so it's short and sharp and snappy, and then we move on to the next person and it's a simple thank you, short and sharp and snappy. So it very much depends on the structure provided by the running order. A really good point, and actually it's something that speakers should bear in mind, that if they have prepared a very long introduction, that should come out of their time. And I think a short introduction is better because at the end of the day, the client's prepared a programme, they've got a website, they've got the full profile in there. You just want something short and relevant just to say, okay, I know why I'm listening to this person. Yeah. Fantastic. That's really, really good advice. So um, what do you think a professional MC can bring to an event as opposed to somebody using somebody internal? So the difference is a professional MC understands and deals very comfortably with change. <laughs> right? um, and secondly, they have a, a, a natural knack for reading a room. And both of those things are really important if you want somebody to manage energy. If you just want somebody to talk about, you know, here's a speaker, here's a speaker, anybody can do that. But if you want somebody to help engage an audience, and it's fine when you have um, really great energizing speakers back to back but let's face it this is very rarely the case <laughs> it's very rarely the case that every single speaker that you've picked is absolutely fabulous and has the energy of the room up some speakers you may have deliberately selected because they're bringing something more grounded and maybe as a, um, a very different energy and it's not quite as, as energy and that's fine. It might just be the nature of the topic that they're talking about is a little bit heavy and necessary. And what you want is somebody who's able to go on, honor the heavy conversation and yet lift the room. If you pick somebody just to introduce a name, that energy from the last talk goes into the next one. So the poor next speaker, this is when you have a speaker kind of going, oh God, I don't believe I've got to follow that. <laughs> yeah, no, perfect, perfect, perfect. So what advice would you give then to members of the audience when they are in the position that they can ask a question? Mm -hmm. So you as the, the host are opening it up, they're asking a question now to the speaker. What advice would you give them to get it right? Keep it short. <laughs> we don't need your backstory. <laughs> like, you know, we you know, fifteen minutes to get to your question. I mean, if you need two minutes for context, that's one thing. But some people just take forever. We want to get a great sort of discussion. We want to answer as many questions as possible. Keep it short. Keep it to a single question, not six questions after the other. That gives me another idea, and that gives me another idea. We're not having a conversation between you and that speaker. Um, so come up with something um, short and snappy that's gonna add value, not just for you, but ideally for everybody else in the room and stick to one question, get it, get the question out in 30 seconds. <laughs> so, yeah. so we've got more time to answer the question. Yeah, and do you think it's better to have spontaneous questions or do you think that, I mean, some speakers I know will prefer to have questions in advance because of who they are uh, and you and I know exactly who we're talking about, which kind of speakers we're talking about, but do you think it's better for them to be spontaneous or should they be prepared? 
I prefer spontaneous. And the primary reason for that is people can feel when you're just going through the motions. Question, answer, question, answer, question, answer. Um, especially when you've got really, because or the alternative is you need somebody who's very good at making it look as though those questions just came spontaneously. I've watched um, dialogue before where somebody's moderating a conversation, a prepared questions, and you can literally watch them literally just ask one question after the other. And it's just not fun to watch. Right? There's no engagement whatsoever. It's just a really dull thing to kind of get involved in and watch. And so um, I think and what that also means is Sometimes there's something really interesting in what the person said, and if there's a dismissive nature when you just kind of go, okay, next question. Um, that said, I understand for people in the public space where perhaps there's a lot of other things going on, politicians, for example, and there's certain topics they just absolutely want to have no aren't covered, um, then pre-prepared questions can be helpful. That said, even in that context, um, I won't name names. I interviewed somebody um, live, very last moment at one point, had quite a history of things that they didn't want brought up. It was like, I don't want to discuss. There was a lot of things that were off the plate. And so in that instance, I didn't have pre-prepared questions with them. Instead, what I said was, look, I have no interest in talking about this, 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 and this. It is not in my, I'm not the sort of um, host and uh, moderator who takes any sort of pleasure whatsoever in making the person I'm interviewing feel uncomfortable. So I will not go anywhere that you are not comfortable to go. So the purpose of this conversation is that your message is across, the organizer feels like they've got, we've stayed on topic for them, and the audience gets some very interesting insights. And I, I'm absolutely going to do that within the context of what feels comfortable for you. And I feel like that conversation is normally quite helpful for people in that space, because really what they want to know is I'm not going to have a confrontational moderator who just wants to take jabs at me. What they want is I want somebody who is just going to stick to the conversation I want to have and not take jabs at me. That's a different sort of environment. And it depends on what the organizer is signed up to as well. Some people are more prepared to go, go wherever, but where they're not, if you want to have an open dialogue, you have to reassure the individual that you're prepared to stay within the realms of what is going to have them feel comfortable. Absolutely. So I'm not going to make you uncomfortable, okay? <laughs> So, listen, you and I met um, online, actually, didn't we? It sounds like some kind of dating thing, but it wasn't. Um, <laughs> we met, uh, and we're members of each other's Facebook groups. We have communities where we support people, which is great. Tell everybody about your group and what you're doing, because I think it's wonderful. So, I own a Facebook group called World Class Female Speakers. Um, I also work as a mentor for female speaker business owners. And the reason I started it is... I was going to say not because I'm a raging feminist, but I don't necessarily think that's true anymore. I think there might be an upraging of my feminism. Um, but the reason I started it isn't because I think women are uh, better speakers than men and deserve better chances than men. Just that I noticed that organizers were struggling to find female speakers. And I just thought, come on, girls, surely we should be able to be doing better than this. So that was really where it started. Um, and it's really a mission to help women work out what the speaking industry is really about and what organizers are looking for such that they can make themselves more visible such that they're easier to find because it's twofold um organizers really struggle to find women i was speaking to an event organizer today who made a really bold decision that she's gonna she on all of the events that she does has at least 50 percent women and when i asked her does that make it harder immediately her immediate response was absolutely it does it makes it a lot harder um, and it's, it's harder to stick to making sure that that's the ratio. And to me, that's what the problem is. Why is it harder? That's got nothing to do with any, anybody else. Go Google, I don't think, says male versus female when it bumps somebody up the list. That just means we haven't got decent enough pages. So I'll get off my soapbox. Yes. <laughs> but yes, you go, but girl. That was, the <laughs> that was the rationale behind it. And it's, it's, a, it's a passion of mine. And I, I love the idea of being able to moderate conferences with a huge amount of diversity. So it, it benefits me as an MC as well. <laughs> absolutely, absolutely. And you're doing some great work there. So thank you for that. Um, so I'm going to, for my final question, I'm going to put you in a time machine. 
And I'm going to take Lavelda back to when you first started emceeing. Mm -hmm. With what you know today, what advice would you give the Lavelda that was starting out? Oh, um, I would have told her to focus on professional video footage rather than just grabbing footage. <laughs> uh, yes, good advice. <laughs> Video everything was a good good starting point, Lavelda, but I would have upgraded that thinking a little bit more um, a bit sooner on. And I probably would have told her to have um, focused on the marketing of, of growing the business sooner um, versus just focusing on the skill. I think both of them you need to do at the same time. It's like it's kind of like being any any business owner and deciding that you're just going to get really good at building a product, but you're not going to get really good at marketing it and really good at selling it. And it makes sense after the fact, but at the time I was focused more on the product <laughs> than I was in getting the product out. That's really top advice. Lavelda, thank you so much for your time. It's been brilliant fun as always. Loved it. Thanks, Maria. <laughs>